Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. My name is Michelle Chuchi, and I'm a professor here at the UW. Um, I'm also a speech pathologist, so that's somebody who would deal with communication and swallowing issues um, in a variety of situations, but I've specialized in neurodegenerative disorders and aging. Um, I'm an associate professor in uh, communication sciences and disorders, and then I have a joint appointment in surgery, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, because I care about things that happen, like communication and swallowing, uh, in the head and neck. I do research. Um, I have a pretty large active lab, and I do actu actually some basic science research on Parkinson's disease. Um, right now, I'm looking at the possibility of Parkinson's disease starting in the gut and spreading inward into the central nervous system, um, which is why I think things like communication and swallowing might be impacted early. So um, I have rat and mouse models of Parkinson's disease, and that's what I look at. And then I consider myself a translational researcher, meaning that what I find in these animal models, then I, t I, t I tend to try to test out in humans. So I have a human research clinical program as well. And I do a lot of teaching on campus, and I teach um, our speech pathology students how to evaluate and treat swallowing disorders, which I think is uh, part of the reason why I was asked here today. So instead of focusing on the basic science research, I wanted to talk to you about how communication and swallowing are affected in Parkinson's disease across the disease process. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask questions about this. So um, I'll give you just a, a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. So what do communication and swallowing disorders look like with Parkinson's disease? It might not be the same for every person, but I'll, I'll give you some generalities. I think it's really important for us to recognize how these kinds of deficits in communication and swallowing affect people, not only their health, but quality of life. And then how as a community can we deal with these issues? And so I'll really talk about early identification, referral, some resources, support groups, and other kinds of groups that you might want to attend. And then, again, um, how to get people referred to speech language pathology and other services so that you might be able to deal with some communication and swallowing issues if you're having them. I'll also talk to you a little bit about what's currently available for treatments. Of course, this would be guided um, with your healthcare team. So that's where, what we're going to do tonight. If you have a question that you feel like is really relevant to the moment, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. Um, I don't mind taking questions during the talk, especially if it helps to clarify something that I've said. Um, and I'll also leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the talk. So one thing that I'd really like to talk about today is that communication is vital to who we are as human beings. We use it in virtually everything we do every day. And swallowing, eating and drinking, is not only for survival, but it's for, we do things for pleasure and in social situations. And so when these two things are different than they were before, it can be really hard on your health status, but also really, really difficult. And this is a huge quality of life issue. So I just want um, you know, people to know, and caregivers and partners to know that these are, you know, there's so many things to deal with, right? You're dealing with medications and movement and sleep and bowels and everything else. But communication and swallowing are also really a, a vital aspect. And these are two aspects of Parkinson's disease that I think really impact people. Um, not everybody's aware of that. And so it's just something to know about and to be able to advocate for yourselves. Sometimes people don't ask you about these things. And so there, there's something that you can do about this if you're having problems. So we'll talk about what those might be and then what you could do about it, how to recognize them and what you can do about it. So there's, I think you've probably been updated a lot on, sort, on the our evolving understanding of Parkinson's disease. So we used to think way back when that Parkinson's disease is a motor only issue. It affects movement and this is, and we think of movement as being in the limbs and walking or 
affecting movement by having a tremor. But you need to remember that when you do the act of swallowing or you are communicating by talking or writing, that's, that's also movement. Um, and it also requires a lot of other systems to be involved that can be imp impacted by Parkinson's disease. Um, a lot of times when you learn about Parkinson's disease, you talk about an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. And you hear a lot about that. You hear about dopamine and probably a lot of people are on medications that modulate dopamine. Um, but this is really a wider issue and I'll just briefly touch on that in a moment. Um, there's also an old way of thinking where people will say, oh, well, speech and swallowing don't get affected until the later stages of Parkinson's disease, so we don't have to worry about that right now. And I know that that's not true. So we need to shift the way that we think about this. And one of the main things is that Parkinson's disease is not just a problem with dopamine, and it's not just a problem only with movement. That Parkinson's disease affects the whole brain, and now we're understanding that uh, pathology can also be in the body. And that Parkinson's disease affects systems, systems that regulate things like your digestion and sleep and sal salivation, saliva production, and swallowing systems and communication systems. So when you're experiencing these things, I think it's good to know that this is, this is part of the process of Parkinson's disease and to be aware of these things early on so that you can prevent them from getting worse or get them addressed right away. Communication and swallowing can be affected at any stage of Parkinson's disease. Everybody's a little bit different. And early detection and treatment are key to, to preserving function and for maintaining quality of life. So if you think about everything that goes into communication, because it's something we just, we learn to do when we're babies and we might take it for granted, that you need your ideas and thoughts and emotions to be expressed. You have facial expression that conveys meaning. You have your throat and your mouth that has to shape the sound to articulate. You need your larynx or your voice box to produce the voice. And you need your lungs to power the voice for respiration. And unfortunately, all of these areas of the brain and body can be impacted by Parkinson's disease, which is why you might see difficulty with speech. So Parkinson disease affects breathing and voice and articulation. Another um, thing that you might not understand um, initially is uh, less expression in the face, right? And so, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the impact of that on other people that you might communicate with. So, you know, mostly when your face isn't moving, when you're expressing ideas, then it looks like you might be disinterested. And that's not maybe what's going on internally, but to the communication partner, it might look like you don't, you're not really interested in what's going on. Uh, voice may be quiet or weak, can't be heard in noise. Oftentimes they'll say my spouse needs hearing aids, which may be true, also true, right? But sometimes it's, it's that your, your voice might be weak. Um, something that might seem a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it in the context of um, maybe sh if you're trying to walk and then you kind of shuffle a little bit and then get going, same thing with speech. So you might have your rate get really fast and then you get going and then things might be slow. Um, words might be indistinct. There might be a monotonous or lacking of emotional tone. Difficult, difficulty getting started. Sometimes people stutter. Um, so a stuttering-like behavior. Um, so here is a, let me see if I can get this to play over the speaker. So here's just an example um, of a man or a woman with some, you know, mild communication deficits with Parkinson's disease. You heard a little? 
Not at all. Okay. That's okay. So in these examples, what you'll hear is, um, you know, we ask people to say, ah, uh, for as long and as loud as you can. And so this gentleman that I was playing, his voice is hoarse. It's pretty quiet, and he's really only able to say ah uh, for shorter bursts. Um, and then when asked to repeat words or syllables, um, there's, the speech sounds a little bit slurry, sort of indistinct words. So one thing that we've been really paying attention to lately is social isolation. And I think that this is a really important aspect of Parkinson's disease because there's a lot of things that might contribute to this. Um, you might not be feeling well, right? You might be having difficulty sleeping. You have medication side effects. Maybe you can't do the things that you liked to do before. Um, so there's, there's a lot of aspects that might go into that on top of a potential communication issue where you might have that masked face so you appear disinterested or people have a hard time understanding you. They're always asking you to repeat yourself and after a couple of times you just think, forget it. I don't, I don't want to have to keep repeating myself. This is exhausting. And so, um, you know, what, what comes first, right? Is it that your communication is getting worse because you're getting out less and you're not practicing talking and you're not being engaged? Or is it that people are slowly being disengaged because of the multiple problems of Parkinson's disease? So it's sort of this chicken and egg problem. But I would say if you remember anything from tonight, I would say one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to stay engaged to do things that you like to do, to get out and talk to people, to even if it's hard to just maybe have a couple of goals. Um, like I said, I, I, I totally understand how hard it is to deal with multiple things all at once. And so this is like one more thing, right? Add, add to the list of things that you need to do. But I would say staying engaged, staying active, talking with people and getting that social reward of being around people, even if it's hard, is really, really crucial, crucial to living well with Parkinson's disease. And you know, um, my grandfather had Parkinson's disease, which is why I got kind of more interested in this. And um, I remember that he didn't want to go out and he didn't want to go out to eat. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And he didn't want to talk to people and we had to be really careful about just like, look, he's having a hard time communicating. How can we create a situation where it's easier for him to be heard and understand, understood? So I'll talk to you a little bit about that when we talk about options. So um, this is just something that I've become um, more interested in lately. And I think it's, it's kind of over, it's an area that we overlook when we're thinking about treatment in general. Swallowing uses a lot of the same systems that speech does. So your brain controls the movement patterns um, for swallowing, for motivation to eat, and also recognizing food. Your cheeks and lips and jaw and teeth and tongue have to chew the food and keep it in the mouth. Then your tongue and throat has to move the food safely to the esophagus while protecting your airway. Um, so your larynx has to close, your voice box has to close up very quickly when you swallow so that food or liquid don't go down the wrong pipe. And then you need good strong lungs to cough in case something does go down the wrong way, which happens to everybody sometimes. It's when it happens a lot over time and you're not clearing it out that it becomes a problem. Swallowing again is one of those things that you don't really think about until you have difficulty doing it. And it's actually a really complex act. So you, you use um, over 60 pairs of muscles. You need really fine motor control. You need intact sensory processing in order to have the right kinds of reactions and the right kinds of muscle movements. And you need good respiratory support. You need to coordinate your swallowing with your breathing. And you need to be able to cough. 
So what I wanted to show you is a video of a person swallowing. So this is an x-ray, it's a side view. You can see here's the eye sockets, here's the teeth, the back of the head, vertebrae here. And what you'll see here is the aerodigestive tract. And up front here is where the larynx is. That needs to close off so that the food goes back here into the esophagus. So this person is swallowing barium. It's a common test we give to check people's swallowing. And I just want you to get an appreciation of how quickly this has to happen, but how coordinated of a movement that is. So I think it's pretty cool that we can, we do this all the time without thinking about it. We actually swallow more um, when we're just swallowing our saliva than when we're eating food or drink throughout the day. So we swallow anywhere between 600 and 1,000 times a day, and about anywhere between 200 and 400 of that is food and liquid. The rest, about 600, is saliva. So again, just thinking about that and keeping that in mind, um, when we're worried about things going down the wrong way, we need to remember that we're also swal swallowing our saliva a lot. Another way that we might look at the swallowing mechanism is through endoscopy. So inserting a camera up through the nose. Now we're looking down on the larynx. So uh, back here is the esophagus and we're actually looking at the vocal cords here. And this is a piece of cartilage that actually flips over to protect your airway when you swallow. And this is the base of the tongue at the, at the very bottom. So again, just looking at this quickly, how quickly and efficiently we tend to swallow. The camera gets whited out because the base of the tongue has to come back, right? But look, the, everything got swallowed down just fine. And that's something, again, that we just take for granted. So here's the same kind of x-ray video that, and it's a failure of someone to swallow efficiently. So you notice as compared to the normal, quote unquote, normal person, this person's a little bit more slow. And then you can see some of that black barium getting stuck in the throat. It's not a terrible swallow. It's not super dangerous at this point. But it's slow and it's not very efficient. Here's a... So right, we're going to start this off here. This is mid-swallow, and you'll see this, the barium. It's a contrast, the liquid here. Nothing's in the airway yet. The airway's up here, but you'll see this is a failure to swallow safely. So food and liquid are going to get into the lungs. You see it coughing some of that up, trying to swallow it down. And this is going down the front. When I show this to speech pathologists, they all go, oh, because they see the barium's just going right into the lungs which is in a great situation. This person has a pretty strong cough, which is, which is good. And the reason why I bring up aspiration, that's when food or liquid gets into the lungs, is because aspiration pneumonia is the leading cause of death with Parkinson's disease. So it's something to really be aware of. Now, just be, if you aspirate, it doesn't mean that you're gonna die from it, right? So I don't want it to be an alarmist here, but it's something to really think about and get evaluated and have managed appropriately so that you don't get things like aspiration pneumonia. That'll make you pretty sick. Here's another one of those camera into the throat videos. And this is also a failure to swallow safely. So they're going down. And you can see that larynx there. And you see uh, we gave this person a little bit of food coloring in their saliva. And you can see here is an open larynx. Here's the larynx, the vocal cords. And here is just their saliva that's tinted with a little bit of food coloring. You can see it's heading down into the airway. And that's just, again, to the point that sometimes you might have difficulty even swallowing your saliva. It's not even just food or liquid. And of course, our mouth has all the good bacteria, but also bad bacteria. So we'll talk about some things to do to, if you are going to aspirate a little bit on your saliva, some things to make, make it a little bit healthier for you. Bless you. So in terms of dysphagia, which is disordered swallowing in Parkinson's disease, here's some things to look out for. Slow chewing or difficulty transferring the liquid to the back of the throat. Um, there's something called tongue pumping, and I'll show you a video of that in a second. 
loss of food or liquid into the airway. So here you can see some barium in the trachea. Oftentimes it takes multiple swallows to swallow something that's pretty even easy to eat. It takes multiple swallows to get it down. Um, so that wastes your energy, right? It's not a very efficient way to swallow. And you might have residue in your mouth after the swallow. So hopefully this will pull up. It's a YouTube video, so hope Oh, good. Sometimes some advertisements come up for things. So this is another one of those moving x-rays, and you'll see this kind of back and forth rocking motion of the tongue. It's not up there? Oh. So that takes a long time for somebody to swallow some pudding there. So one of the consequences of unsafe swallowing is that you can have aspiration of food or liquid into your lungs. Um, you might have residue left over in your throat that can also then be aspirated. Um, also, um, food or liquid can get stuck in the esophagus. Some people have achalasia, which is a narrowing of the esophagus or sometimes esophageal spasms. To me, um, that's some of the first things that people tend to report. And then people also have, with Parkinson's have an increased incidence of reflux. The, the, the thing is, um, some of the earlier things that happen with swallowing or voice or with reflux can also be attributed with aging. And so people you know, in the early, early stage of the Parkinson's disease might sort of disregard these kinds of things because you think, well, I'm also getting older and this is common. But um, what I would say is that I think that we should pay attention to this early on because you might be having some milder problems with your esophagus or some subtle swallowing difficulties, but this means that you might be on a pathway of having more difficulty with swallowing, so why not start doing things to try to prevent that from getting worse over time? So I, I put this on your handout, just a kind of a summary of swallowing deficits. So you have. The bolus is what you're going to eat or drink. That's what you'll hear people call it. So when you have difficulty propelling the bolus and clearing it, you'll have residue, you'll have airway compromise, and you'll have inefficient swallowing, and then sometimes inability to meet nutrition and hydration needs. And that's when it starts to get a little bit more um, serious where you would need to, to really start getting this treated. Just another thing to think about is that um, it's a rare, more rare complication of dysphagia, but people with difficulty swallowing um, are at increased risk of choking. And so if you haven't done this yet, um, family members, caregivers, um, make sure to learn your basic life-saving skills. Okay, so um, this is just to get you kind of also, um, you know, not as bored from listening to me just talk on, right? But I wanted, I wanted you to just turn towards somebody and talk about the, the previous two days, just for a minute or two. So think about where you ate or what you ate or who, and who you were with, what you talked about, or if you traveled here, for example, um, who you communicated with as you traveled, or um, you could talk about whether or not you had to use your cell phone in the past couple days. So I'm just gonna give you a minute. So as you're wrapping up your conversations, what I guess I wanted to get everybody thinking about is just what a big part of our lives eating and communicating are, right? And then I just want you to imagine if you had to eat through a tube in your stomach or you had to order special items or prepare special food or thicken your liquids or the people that you were with couldn't understand you or you couldn't use your phone to get help with your travel, or you couldn't talk to the person that, or your loved ones, or communicate how you're feeling because you have a hard time talking. And I, this is why communication and swallowing are so vital to our, our daily lives and why it's so important to try to preserve this function and to address this. And as I mentioned before, communication and swallowing problems can negatively affect quality of life. So we use communication to navigate life, at our work, with relationships, and to connect with other people. 
And eating and drinking are not only for survival, so we eat for pleasure. I always say this to my students, if we ate only to, for survival, we'd all be drinking water and you know, eating protein and like raw vegetables only, right? So we all, we all like the taste of food, we eat for pleasure. It gives us a lot of reward, right? Reward, so it tastes good and it feels good and it activates the reward system in your brain. And eating and drinking are a social outlet. So if you wanna meet with somebody, what do you suggest you do? Coffee, bar, right? It's Wisconsin. Let's go out for a beer. So um, just really, you know, really keep that in mind. And then dining is a social activity that revolves around communication. So we're not just eating, we're dining. We dine with friends and family and colleagues, and that can be negatively impacted if you have a swallowing disorder. Um, this really happened with my grandfather a lot. He was reluctant to eat in public because he was embarrassed about drooling and his slow movement. He was afraid of choking. He also had a pretty significant tremor. This is a pretty long time ago. This was about, this was about 30 years ago when it was like, here's your levodopa, good luck, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, you might have difficulty with reach to eat movements too. So just actually getting the food into your, or drink into your mouth to swallow can be difficult. Um, so there's good news, bad news. The bad news is the currently used common medical interventions like levodopa or Mir uh, Mirapax or deep brain stimulation don't help communication and swallowing problems. So while these are wonderful for treating other aspects of Parkinson's disease, they either don't help or sometimes can even have a negative impact on communication and swallowing. So that's the bad news. This is the common things that we do um, but the, the good news is that um, we have some other things that we can do to address these. And, and so I wanted to make you aware of those today if you aren't already. Okay, so how do I know if I or my loved one has a communication or swallowing disorder? Um, these are just some common things to ask yourself or ask your partner. Um, do people have a hard time understanding you? Can you be understood on the telephone? The telephone is tough. Do you get asked to repeat yourself? Does your partner need hearing aids? <laughs> Has anyone noticed a change in your voice? Are there foods that you don't eat anymore? The, to me, that's a big one. I'll say, are you having any swallowing difficulty? No. Mm, I'm, is there anything you're not eating? Oh, yeah, I can't eat steak, and I cough a lot if I drink water. Um, is there anything that's really hard for you to eat or drink? Do you cough before or during or after eating? Does your voice get gurgly while you eat or drink? So you saw that the barium and the saliva go literally going down the wrong pipe, right? Um, so sometimes your voice can get gurgly and that's a sign of that. Or have you had pneumonia recently? So um, Basically, if the answer is yes to any of those things, I think that you, this is something that you should bring up with your healthcare practitioner so that you can get this addressed sooner rather than later. So let's say you um, think that you might have some difficulty with communication or swallowing. What do, you, what do you do about it? And so medical management of communication and swallowing disorders typically happens by a speech language pathologist or speech therapist and the physician team. So for example, if you go to see Nancy and you, you talk about this and you say, I think I'm having difficulty swallowing, she'll say, okay. Um, let's, and she'll get some more information and then she would get a, a referral to a speech pathologist to evaluate you. Um, so you can get a communication evalu evaluation and the speech pathologist would look at your voice, your quality of life, and then also cognition, right? So your thinking ability can sometimes affect the way that you speak or the, your choice of words. And they'll also evaluate language just in case you might be having some issues with um, sort of higher level type thinking and, and speaking difficulties, not just the movement part of it. With a swallowing evaluation, what often happens is that you'll go to a speech pathologist and give the history. Um, you know, sometimes Parkinson's disease isn't the only thing that you've had go on. 
Um, so there might be other things that would affect swallowing, like um, maybe a head or neck cancer or a stroke or something like that too. So um, people will take your history, talk about things that are hard and easy for you to eat or drink, you know, assess when this problem started, how much is it affecting you, and then probably do an exam to just look at how your tongue moves and your voice sounds and things like that. And then you would get an evaluation um, with a special instrument like that swallow study that I showed you, that modified barium swallow study with a moving x-ray or else the swallow study with a camera looking down into your throat. And those tests are really vital for the speech pathologist to make a determination about what the problem is. Are you having trouble moving the, what you're eating and drinking because you're having issues with your tongue? Or is there, are there things that are getting into your airway? If so, there's, there's things we can do about that. Um, and then the speech pathologist would coordinate this care with your neurologist or primary care physician and a treatment plan would be made. Um, I think it's really important that you see a speech pathologist that knows a lot about swallowing disorders and Parkinson's disease, just like I think it's really important for your neurologist and neurology group to be movement disorder specialists. Um, and sometimes we get the help of otolaryngology because they know a lot about uh, how to help treat swallowing disorders, especially if you might need some kind of intervention, like if the top of your esophagus is really tight and it needs to be dilated or something like that. So those are the people that would help address your communication and swallowing problems. So with the evaluation, we say, um, you know, does this person have a communication and swallowing problems? And I think the answer is probably yes to some degree, even in the early stages. It doesn't mean that your communication is not functional or your swallowing isn't functional, right? And you're, you might be getting by. But just like everything else, let's say you know that your walking someday might be impaired. Oftentimes we'll say, okay, we'll make sure to get out and walk and let's do some physical therapy so that this doesn't go downhill. And I, I think the same thing is true for communication and swallowing. You have to really look at it early, see if there's any kind of change, and then start doing things like exercises and really paying attention to it so it, you don't know, wait till it gets really bad. So being proactive about this versus being reactive. Um, communication and swallowing impairments don't correlate well with general disease severity. Everybody's a little different. And so some people might find that their speech was the first thing that they noticed that was affected. Some people's speech doesn't get affected until later on. So again, just keeping an eye on that. Part of Parkinson's disease is not processing sensory information correctly. So again, we think of Parkinson's disease as movement, movement disorder, but you actually need to use sensory information to figure out what's going on in the world around you. And people with Parkinson's disease have less ability to notice if there's an error in their movement, right? And so oftentimes people don't know, for example, that their voice has gotten really quiet. And you have to actually videotape the person and show them a videotape and so they can hear their own voice so that they'll know, oh yeah, that does sound really quiet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat the question in case, so it can get picked up by the video too. So he's asking, can this come and go? Maybe your voice gets quiet and a little shaky and then gets a little better for a couple years and, and it can come and go and the answer is absolutely. It's not just this linear you know, decline. And I think sometimes um, you start to compensate for what's going on so people don't hear you and they're asking you what, so you might, you might actually be paying attention to that a little bit. Um, I think you guys all know Parkinson's disease causes a lot of fluctuations in everything that you do. So some days tremors way worse than other days or walking or thinking or whatever it is. So yes, absolutely. There's day-to-day -day fluctuations, and I think over time, there's probably year-to-year -year fluctuations in that too.
Thanks for that question. Yeah. The list of information you're giving is very helpful, but it's also very costly to see all those different doctors and have all those different tests for people with very high deductible health insurance plans. Do you have any alternative suggestions or, you know, if we have the money to go see one of those people on your list, who would you start with and what one thing a year would you do? Sure. That's a great question. So, right. So you can't, I mean, all of, the, uh, all of us that are in subspecialties would say, well, you need to go see an, OT, an occupational therapist and a physical therapist and a speech pathologist and a movement disorder specialist and a sleep specialist. And so I, I, that point is well taken. Um, the person that you absolutely need to see is, is your neurologist, right? Because they're going to coordinate this care. Um, speech pathology is co typically covered by insurance and Medicare um, for, for dysphagia and um, communication disorders. So it should be something covered, but it, you're right, there might be a high deductible. I would say though, the cost of having aspiration pneumonia and having to be hospitalized and then go to maybe a transitional care facility for a while, and that is, is a lot higher than going to see somebody if you truly have um, a swallowing disorder that's risky. So I think that's a hard question to answer. Um, I mean, like, are there online sources? Are there free clinics? Are there? Um, I don't know about, so I think that um, there's, if you think you might be having a swallowing problem, I'll, I'll tell you about things that you might be able to do, but it's sort of like, you, then you're self-diagnosing and you're doing things that might not even really be helping you necessarily. Um, I think what we try to do um, in medicine is, for if we know what the situation is, like, look, I'm self-paying for this, then you set up a home program, right? Or, you know, you so you, you kind of try, try to tailor it to that. Um, but... Uh, I, I do think it's, a, it's important to have the best available knowledge in order to be safe and practical about that. So um, I think that that is a good discussion to have too with um, like for example, a social worker who might be able to coordinate services and care. So I'm thinking of, you know, swallowing to me is a little bit more dangerous of a problem that you would really want to deal with. With communication, let's say um, you know somebody would recommend speech therapy, but it's not covered or it's really expensive. There are things like groups that you can go to to, to practice those things, and there are some some online things that you can do. Um, I know I'm not really answering your question, but yeah, okay. I, well, yeah, to me that's the that's the because you got to look at this whole picture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's a, so he was saying that he noticed there was some kind of correlation for him between dehydration and swallowing problems. So um, I won't have you do this, but so I'll have my students do this sometimes because the role of saliva in swallowing is really important. So has anybody tried to like eat a saltine cracker and then like just swallow? Or if I have you swallow like five times without taking a sip of water, you don't, you won't, your muscles aren't fatiguing. Let me try it, just like swallow and then and try to swallow all your saliva. Swallow again. And swallow again. It's really hard to swallow. Yeah, I think it, that's a complex question. So where does the dehydration come from? So is it because, um, I mean, there's so many different processes happening in your body. Now we're understanding that Parkinson's does affect your peripheral nervous system too. So is it some kind of regulation with your body? Are you not drinking as much because it's difficult to drink? Are you not having the drive to drink because you're not thirsty? Is it because you have rigidity in your muscles and they're always activated and you're using more water? I mean, I think it's, it, that's a pretty complicated question.
but if you are dehydrated, you will have less saliva, right? And you can't swallow unless you have this, a sensory trigger to swallow, and that has to be something that you're eating or drinking. And if you don't have saliva, it's really hard to, if you don't have a lubrication, it's hard. So um, a lot of people will sometimes have salivary tumors, for example, and we take out their salivary glands, and then they have a really, really hard time swallowing, so they're ha having to constantly like wet their mouths and use artificial um, saliva to actually just be able to swallow. So that's, that's why there's that correlation there. And then, yeah, if you're on, yeah, absolutely. If you're on medication, I think you're talking about maybe prior. We're, we're talking prior to medication. No, still, yeah. I, there's some courses, there's some... Well, everything's better when you're hydrated, right? I don't know. I'd, I'd have to. I don't know if it's because of the Parkinson's or because of other things that happen with the Parkinson's. Okay, and so the, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is, so we, we talk about how Parkinson's, or symptoms of communication and swallowing disorders because of the Parkinson's disease might be under noticed by the patient, but sometimes it's also under noticed by the practitioner. So I think here in this area, we're pretty good about asking about those things, but sometimes people don't ask about it, so they'll ask about other things and they don't mention communication or swallowing. If you're not bringing it up, they might not ask. And then um, there's a unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, and it has a couple of questions about communication and swallowing, but I think they're terrible, and they don't get at any of the really subtle issues that are going on, especially in the beginning. So um, the, the scales that we use um, don't necessarily call these kinds of problems to attention. So I think that sometimes, that's why Nancy asks me to come here every couple of years too, just so you can be an advocate for yourself. So you know what to look for and you can bring it up and you can, you can deal with this. Okay, so again, this would, be, this would be handled by your healthcare professional in the context of a team, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that are available to you as a patient um, if you have a communication disorder or a swallowing disorder. So we'll start first. This is a list that you have. I know these are acronyms. But I'm gonna go through each one of these. Um, so the first one that we'll talk about is called Lee Silverman Voice Therapy or LSVT Loud. It's probably the most common treatment for communication disorders and Parkinson disease. Um, there's, there's actually some good evidence from clinical trials that this is helpful. It's not always helpful to everybody though. Everybody's just a little different. And so some people say, you know, I did that and it didn't, it didn't really help, or I did that a while ago and now things are going downhill. So again, just like you know, Parkinson's is different for every person, some treatments work better than others. But this is an exercise-based communication treatment and it's performed by a licensed speech pathologist, although I think you can take aspects of this and, and do this on your own too. And basically what it does is it, you have a single target which is be louder. And that takes all of the, the load off of your brain to have to you know, like think about like take a deep breath and then be louder and really try to enunciate and, and you know, do all these multi-step things. So when you ask a man to get louder, these things happen to get better with this. And so there's a single target, right? So the amplitude of your voice, the loudness of your voice, and it's an intensive training, it's four days a week for four weeks, and that is so that you can make a habit out of it, and you start in the clinic, and then you have homework and home practice. And then the, the most important thing I think that this gets to is this calibration. So remember I said before there's sort of a mismatch between how loud you might think your voice is and how loud you're actually talking? And it turns out that if you ask people to get louder, they say, well, I sounds like I'm shouting. And you say, good. This is, this is how loud you have to be to be understandable. And it doesn't really ever normalize, so you don't, ever, you don't feel like you're not shouting, ever. But you realize how much effort you need to make. So I think about it, making a hand movement. Let's say I go like this. Somebody says, no, that's not, that's not big enough. You have to go like this. And I say, well, I feel like I'm like really over-exaggerating. And that's how you have to feel to be loud enough. So I think that this particular therapy it does a really good job of addressing multiple aspects of the communication disorder. 
Um, there's another treatment called expiratory muscle strength training, or EMST. And so this is a device that you get. Again, you'd want somebody to show you how to use it and make sure that you have the right settings. But that is to train your respiratory muscles. Um, and so you, you blow into this tube with a resistance. You do it every day intensively. You increase the resistance. This has been shown to really help with swallowing and cough. And now there's a little bit of evidence showing that this might help to improve speech. So this might be a recommendation that's made to you by a speech pathologist. There's augmentative and alternative communication. So these are communication boards. They can be high tech, as in you know, a fancy iPad with programs and you know, a voice that speaks with you. Can also be very low tech, right? So you could actually print out important pictures or phrases that somebody could point to if they're having a really hard time talking or moving that they can say, I need to use the bathroom. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. I want to go to bed, I don't want to talk to you anymore, those kinds of things. Um, so again, um, I'm, I'm kind of recommending the standard, keeping in mind the really nice comments about, like, we can't do everything, you know, are there some things to do? But if you get a device, um, either be good at programming it or, or get somebody to help you out with it, or else you just feel like you've wasted your money, or do something low-tech. I think that's a, a really nice thing to do. There is um, a device called Speech5. Uh, this was designed by a speech scientist, a speech pathologist. And what, ha what it is is a little microphone, basically, that sits on your neck and picks up your voice, and then a speaker that goes into your ear. And it, it takes advantage of the Lombard effect, which is when you hear noise, you automatically get louder. So remember I said, you know, with the, the voice therapy that you're always having to think about your voice being louder. This um, actually plays a noise in your ear so that your voice gets louder automatically when you start talking. So if you're having trouble learning, this tech, you know, learning the speech therapy techniques, this can sometimes be an appropriate thing to do to make the voice louder. There's also something called delayed auditory feedback, and that again, when you're here, so you, you have a microphone on your neck, you hear your own voice, and then, but it's on a little bit of a delay, and when that happens, you automatically start talking a little bit louder, and sometimes your, your pronunciation gets a little bit more clear. Again, doesn't, doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Um, I've tried this before, and I get, I get really confused when I start to hear my own voice. I don't know if that has ever happened to you on your cell phone or something like that. So sometimes it can really just make things worse. But um, for some people, this works really, really well. And then there's also amplifiers um, or FM systems so that um, if your voice is quiet, you can wear a microphone with a little bit of a speaker and people can hear you. Um, I think things like noisy restaurants, uh, it's really hard to be heard. Tire, it's tiring to talk loudly, um, or somebody might not be able to hear you in your home. So this is another viable option for you. I don't think I had this video. Yeah, it's not going to work. Um, some people who have more severe stuttering-like behaviors, um, if you have just a like a piece of paper or a board where somebody has to tap while they're talking. So each syllable has a tap. It'll help eliminate some of that stuttering behavior. Um, again, your speech isn't totally natural, but if you're stuttering so much that it's interfering, sometimes tapping while you're talking can help reduce that. And then to me, here's, here's some really low hanging fruit, right? So optimize the communication conditions. So get rid of background noise, get rid of distractions, turn off the television, things like that, right? So, so really get the environment optimal for communication. Face-to-face -face is always better. We got a lot of cues from facial movements and lip movement and understanding people's speech, especially when it's impaired. And they'll have an easier time understanding you if you're face-to-face -face with them. And then message-centered communication. So what I mean by that is I could say, 
do you want chicken for dinner? Do you want chicken? Or I could say, well, I don't know. What I, I was thinking of making dinner, and I'm thinking about making chicken or roast beef. I'm not sure which one you want. What do you think? Right, I mean, I do, this is basically I think how I talk to my husband and kids, right? But I could just say, chicken? Yes or no, right? So just really getting to the heart of what you're trying to say without trying to add more to it. So to me, we could all go home and do this right away. You don't need a speech pathologist for that. Then there's some other, um, what I think are kind of cool um, new therapies. There's not really um, firm evidence for this yet, but I think that's because it hasn't been studied in a controlled fashion, right? So it's not like it's been studied and it doesn't work, but there's a Speak Out Loud Crowd program that's available in a lot of places. People really enjoy it. It's more of a group setting, gets you out there, um, and I, I hear that it's really helpful, so that's something that you could look into. Um, and I don't, I think it is pretty low cost. Um, and then there's singing and music therapy. So singing's kind of interested because it uses other parts of your brain that aren't necessarily active with speech. And sometimes when you're having a hard time with speech, singing can come out easier. Um, and then, you know, music therapy or group singing has been shown to help improve speech a little bit, but also you're just, you're out there and you're moving around. Um, and if you enjoy singing, then I think it's a nice thing to do. I always tell people, they say, what should I do um, in terms of exercise or in terms of speech? And I say, you know, do you like to sing? If you do, I would do a group singing thing or like, do, you know, do you like yoga? No, I hate yoga. Okay, don't do yoga then. You're not going to all of a sudden like yoga because you have Parkinson's disease, right? So you want to do things that you like. I think this is a nice thing to do. Do you have a question? It is extremely social, exactly. He's saying group singing is also extremely social. So getting at that social isolation versus you know doing ac loud exercises at home, which will also help you. Getting out there and connecting with people, I think, is, is good for your, your brain and your soul. I'm not going to play this. It was just, um, there's a PD Glee group that was run here before. I hope they get it going again. Oh, yeah, that's not going to work. But it was really fun. Um, I don't, do you guys remember the show Glee that was on for a long time about the a cappella singing and dancing group? So there was a, a Parkinson disease Glee group, which was fun. So that was run through the Wisconsin chapter of the APDA. So there, there, there's things that are enjoyable and fun that you could do that I think are, are helpful to communication and combating social isolation. Then in terms of swallowing, there's also these exercise programs that I mentioned before. So the ex expiratory muscle strength training and LSVT Loud has benefits to swallowing as well. So that's kind of one of the things that might address both subsystems. So again, I gave you the summary, and then I'll go through these individually. So with the LSVT Loud speech therapy, they found improved movement of the base of the tongue and some improvements in the oral in the pharyngeal stages, and um, this has improved oral pharyngeal um, speed. So they found that just swallowing sped up a little bit after a course of this therapy. So there's some, if you do this LSVT therapy, there might be some crossover to the swallowing systems, but not necessarily. With respiration and swallowing, um, weakness and voluntary cough is related to penetration and aspiration, and that expiratory muscle strength training actually led to decreased penetration, so getting food or liquid getting into the larynx, and aspiration. So if I had to pick one, um, I would say, you know, figure out, you know, what, what is going on? Am I having aspiration? Do I have a weak cough? Am I having communication issues? And f kind of figure out what a good treatment plan would be for you. Um, another thing that we might recommend, and you don't want to do this unless somebody actually saw you swallow and do this in a modified barium swallow study, is that um, you can actually change the way you swallow. So people might ask you to, for example, put your chin down when you swallow. And what that does is it pulls your voice box up a little bit and gets it out of the way so that when you swallow, 
Um, it's a little bit more protected, and that's been found to be a good strategy in people with Parkinson's disease if they're, if they're aspirating. But you actually need to get that evaluated because it doesn't necessarily help. It depends on what the problem is. So I'll say this, and then you might you know, notice that you have a gurgly voice or difficulty with water, and you think you're coughing on water. You might tuck your chin and try it and see if it works, but you'd really want to know if this is helping me or not. In some instances, for example, it might make your swallowing worse. So just don't want you to like go do these things without some kind of guidance. Um, oftentimes, we'll recommend diet modifications. Um, so you, sometimes having more a bigger bolus or something more in your mouth to swallow actually activates more sensation, makes your swallow a little bit stronger. For some people, it's harder. Right, so again, something to be thought of and evaluated. Um, sometimes a smaller bolus to swallow is better. Uh, sometimes we'll change texture, so if chewy foods or things that are getting stuck in your throat and in your esophagus are a problem, we might recommend that you grind it up or add some liquid to it. Um, so there's different levels of diet modifications. You know, there's a lot of good cookbooks out there and ways to modify recipes, but it's it, not that fun to have to modify your diet. So we really try not to do that unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, unfortunately, I think in my field, in speech pathology, we sort of default to, oh, let's change the diet or let's thicken the liquids, right? If you thicken them then they don't go back as fast, and you have a time for your airway to close and protect itself. And there have been studies that show that with thickened liquids, you have less aspiration. But A, who wants to do that? Does anybody enjoy like thickened milk or coffee? Not really, right? So we really try to avoid that as much as possible. And then also, if your liquids are thickened and you aspirate them, it's harder for your lungs to clear. So we're really trying to get away from doing that unless it's absolutely necessary. And we need to monitor people um, if this happens. One thing that we've been doing a lot more is um, really paying attention to oral care. And then if people are having trouble with aspiration of liquids, we just have you separate liquids out from the rest of the meal. You eat your meal, brush your teeth, make sure everything's clear, and then you just drink some sterilized water. And that way, if you do aspirate it, it would teach you how to cough, maybe do some expiratory muscle strength training. And then if you aspirate water, it's not going to cause as much aspiration if you're aspirating something like orange juice, which would be bad for you to aspirate. So um, I think hopefully we're, we're moving toward that a little bit more and changing people's diet less and trying to really avoid this from happening or doing some exercises and some other things to make it happen. Um, there are times when tube feeding is recommended. And I know that's a scary thing to think about, but um, sometimes people just aren't able to get enough nutrition and hydration in eating by mouth. And if somebody does end up getting a feeding tube, it doesn't mean that you can't eat or drink anything ever again. That's kind of a myth that people think, like if I get a feeding tube, it's over, and that's not true. So sometimes if you're really dehydrated or not getting enough calories, people might recommend a feeding tube so that they can supplement you. You can still eat for pleasure and enjoyment, but not worry about I've got to eat all and drink all of this to really maintain my health. So it's just something that I want to put out there as a, a let's rationally think about what this would mean for me if, if this were, would need to happen. And it's not the end of things, it just might be something that helps get you over um, just being in a deficit for your food and your hydration. And then as I mentioned before, oral hygiene is really important. So your muscle rigidity, tremor, or hypokinesia, slowness of movement can impact your ability to perform your oral hygiene routine. And patients with Parkinson's disease have an increased risk of periodontal disease. So um, we did a webinar through the Parkinson's Foundation on swallowing, and then I did this with a dentist who has Parkinson's disease, Jane Bush. And so she talks a lot about oral care, which is you really need to brush and floss more often. You need to be rinsing out your mouth a lot more often. 
um, and going to the dentist more, a little bit more frequently if you can. And then um, there's drooling. And I think, oh, oh yeah, yep. Mm hmm It's a good question. So he's saying, what do you do if your tremor, you're trying to brush your teeth and your tremor is so bad that you end up sticking your toothbrush down your throat. So if you have, even though it's really hard to use your non-dominant hand, sometimes tremor is better in one hand, got them in both, too hard in both. So then there's some, there's some adaptive, I know, it's really hard. Um, so there's some uh, more adaptive equipment, some things that are a little bit easier to hold, like versus a toothbrush, which you really need to, to, to pinch. So sometimes your tremor might not be as bad if you have like a wider, a wider grip thing. Um, if you look up that webinar, Jane talks a little bit more about it. And if it's so bad that you can't brush your teeth at the moment too, I just recommend you know, do like doing rinses and swishes and, yep. I tried, uh, tried all that. Your tremor, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the electric toothbrushes are great because they really get in there for you. But I would say that you would need something, a better adaptive piece of equipment. So again, if you would bring that up to somebody, you call your neurologist, they might, ha they, might you, they might be able to just refer you to somebody who could be like, here, like order this specific kind of thing. So tremor tends to get worse when you try to do a fine motor task, right? So if you have like a big, a big thing to hang on to, uh, you're gonna, that, so that is a specific, again, everybody's a little different, so you're gonna have to talk to somebody who specializes in that and has some ideas for you about what to do. Okay, so drooling is an issue with Parkinson disease. It actually is caused by the motor def deficit. So there's, you have a reduced natural frequency of swallowing. We s swallow our saliva all day long. People with Parkinson's disease don't really get that sensory trigger, it's time to swallow. And then we think it's probably worsened by medications sometimes. So again, everybody's different. Some people need cues to swallow, so they might get, for example, like a watch that will vibrate every couple of minutes, you get a vibration, you remember to swallow. There's behavioral therapy. Sometimes people will prescribe medicine. Um, and sometimes people do Botox to the salivary glands if drooling is so bad that it's uncontrolled. So again, everybody's a little different. What works for some person might not work for another person. So this is something that can also be addressed in speech therapy. And then um, finally, um, I think all of this uh, has, is in the larger picture of community and wellness, right? So getting out there, going to support groups. And um, you know, for you, sir, maybe if you talk about this at a support group, somebody's like, oh, I had that, here's what I did, kind of tips or tricks and things like that. Um, I know sometimes support groups can also be scary. Um, so there's different kinds of support groups. So DBS support group, young onset might have a different um, you know, need set, like I'm still working, I'm a young mother, you know, wh what do I do about this? Versus, you know, people who are in different stages or different needs. So I think, you know, support group is a pretty general term and you n need to find the one that's right for you. Um, but what's nice about things like that and I think what's nice about moving forward is that this is a comfortable, more comfortable environment where people share similar problems. And so you can, you can, it helps to reduce some embarrassment and shame. And you know, unfortunately with disease, especially in our culture, there, there is embarrassment and shame that come along with not being able to do things that you did before or um, drooling or things like that. And so that's something to, to address in terms of wellness and, and also helps to increase your confidence. So I find that um, there's a lot of, in big, you know, in conferences or um, like the World Congress on Parkinson's disease or in moving forward or even in support groups, people really come together and they talk about, you know, not only things that are, they're having a hard time with, but also ways that they may be coping with the disease or talk about how this is, this has helped me to embrace things that I really love and do things that I enjoy and this is how I'm living well with this. And I think it's a good place to, to share those things. Um, and also let's remember that caregiver support is also vital. 
it's hard it's hard to take care of somebody um, especially if it's your loved one for example and people can it's hard and you can get burned out and tired um, and you, sometimes you might need somebody else to talk to sometimes you know it's nice to go together to things but sometimes the people living with Parkinson's disease need to talk to other people when they're their partner's not around so that they can they can get out what they need to get out to without having, you know, maybe somebody listen to that. Same thing for the caregiver. Maybe they just need to be like, ah, this is really hard for me. And somebody else look at them and say, yeah, I see, I see you, I see that in you. So let's just not forget uh, the role of the other people in our lives too and make sure that we get them the support that they need as well. And then, um, I think it's also important to vet your clinicians and programs. So you wanna find a movement disorder specialist or a physical therapist or an exercise program that's designed for people with Parkinson's disease. Because there's, there's, you have a special need set and, and people will have good tips and tricks for you. And then finally, um, not everybody's the same. And so you need to, you need to find an, some individual plans or programs that are good for you. People have different communication um, situations. Somebody might be working in real estate still. Somebody um, you know, might have trouble in specific situations. There's also specific swallowing situations. So um, maybe you go out to dinner when you, only when you're feeling good for that night and you have flexible plans around that. Or you, know, you might still be working and you need to be having lunches and things like that. So you need to figure out like, what is it that I can order? How do I optimize? myself, make sure I'm hydrated, things like that before I go. Um, you might want to eat before just so you can order something kind of easy and you don't have to try to get all your calories and drink everything at this, you know, like higher pressure situation. Um, some people have preferences and we need to honor that. Some people hate thickening their liquids. Some people don't mind it. Um, we need to understand that people have different access to services. Um, finances, different amounts of time to do this, and access to transportation. So I can give you all these things to do, but of course um, I know that we need to, to tailor this to, to your individual situation, and so that's always something to, to keep in mind. Um, with that, I gave you my contact information in case you have any follow-up questions um, or comments. And um, I wanted to just say thanks again for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you have.